Welcome to the Orchestrate All the Things podcast. I'm George Amadiotis and we'll be connecting the dots together. Decision intelligence is one of those terms that sound vaguely familiar even if you've never come across it before. Like many category defining terms, it can mean different things to different people. This is a feature category defining terms either have by design or acquired through extensive use. In October 2021, Gartner identified decision intelligence as a 2022 top trend. A number of vendors have identified the category, including Aira Technology, which claims to have been doing decision intelligence before it was even called that. Today, Aira is announcing new capabilities for its Aira Decision Cloud at the Gartner Supply Chain Symposium. Aira founder and CTO Sarik Mansour weighed in on decision intelligence, Aira's offering, and how it is relevant for supply chains and beyond. I hope you will enjoy the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, So my background is all around software, uh, enterprise software. So so prior to launching Aira Technology in 2007, so Fred and I had a vision for a business uh, for the era decision cloud platform. I mean, it was not called uh, decision cloud at that time, and we actually called it a self-driving enterprise. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was very clear in our mind what is needed uh, in the market. So, and I was working for several years to build the underlying data foundation for what we call like decision cloud now and when i met fred in late 2016 uh, it it was great synergy i mean as he was looking to build the same platform so we went ahead we raised uh, 50 million and we started the journey to make our vision you know a reality and then after over 4 years of uh, you know hard work we launched the entire di platform and now, I mean, this platform is proven, running at scale at some of the biggest companies on the planet, and we have a very happy customer. And, you know, George, I mean, it's, uh, it's great to see how the vision become a reality, because at that time, no one in the industry was talking about transforming decision making. And now there's a whole new category emerging around the world. And, you know, and then it's, I mean, it feels good when analysts and customers and partners telling us, that we are transforming the you know the future of work and, and have a unique platform. I mean, it's for us is very exciting times. Great, thank you for the introduction. And yes, indeed, I have to say, even though I have a very uh, um, superficial, let's say, uh, familiarity with with what you do. I mean, in the time that I had, um, it was quite uh, apparent that there is lots of uh, breadth and depth in in the platform. And so I can tell that you have been uh, probably working on this for uh, for a long time. Uh, but before we get to the actual platform, as uh, by means of introduction, uh, and since you also referred to uh, category and category uh, creation in a way, and I think this is probably part of uh, what you have been doing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, decision intelligence in general, because it's also relevant in the uh, in the context of uh, the announcement you're going uh, to make on uh, Monday at uh, Gardner Symposium. And so I think for many people, uh, the term is not really uh, familiar. And actually, I should probably count myself among those people. I was just vaguely familiar, but not really uh, familiarized myself in depth. After looking a bit into that, um, what struck me was well that it seems to be like a composite term in a way that sort of touches upon and uh, uh, merges, let's say, different uh, disciplines, but related. So things like data science and data engineering and analytics and machine learning and some rule-based uh, decision-making as well. Um, so how, how would you define the, the category and how, what do you think makes it different and sort of uh, more than the sum of its parts, let's say? Yeah, I mean, good question. And I think if, uh, I mean, what I'll do is, I mean, think about like your list. I mean, it's a good list, what you just mentioned, uh, you know, the different technology. I mean, I would, I would add, you know, maybe four or five more things to it to, to make this DI technology why it's so unique. Okay. So, and maybe it's, it's good if I can give you a reference to how we were thinking about it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what's the thinking behind it. Okay. So, 
So yes, you're right. I mean, this uh, data engineering is uh, one component, but data engineering alone is not enough. So what we have done is not just provided like a data workbench to the data engineers to go and do the work, but also added like a lot of pre-built data models for all the major areas within the enterprise, like, you know, sales and inventory and, you know, procurement and promotions, logistics, and several other areas, okay? And then what one of the big things which we have done and we have looked at it, we have developed like a technology, a patent technology is to actually not just give the models, but actually be able to then crawl and automate their entire process of extraction, normalization, harmonization of these, all these models across multiple ERP systems and, you know, bringing all of this content also into the platform, okay? And then interconnected. And we call it as like, you know, it's, it's like the CDL, which is a cognitive data layer, okay? And what the idea is with this content, with this all these subject areas and all these dimensions and thousands of measures, this all automatically built, and then this part itself provide a huge value for the customer. Because as you know, George, I mean, in the data side, what happens? I mean, most of the projects were like start and then people trying to figure out what data, where to get, what information, you know, I mean, it's, it's become really hard. The enterprise data model is completely fragmented across literally hundreds of systems, you know, out there. To be able to build that layer and content and making part of that platform, I think that's one big, big differentiation. If you look at it, why it's different, uh, you know, than just combining different tools together, okay? And the other thing in your list, if you look at it, I mean, one thing I would add definitely is that, you know, we call it like an engine to digitize human decision logic, you know, as part of a platform. So one of the things pattern which we have uh, filed and built, we call it DFE, which is depth first execution graph. So take a complex human decision, okay, and logic, and then be able to digitize it and then execute it at scale, okay? So it's not like separate tools for machine learning and separate rules engine. What we have done, we have combined uh, this probabilistic engines, like, you know, the predictions, with the deterministic logic, like, you know, the what else, uh, the, the if and then logic there. And, and this is very powerful because this is a core to automate this entire decision process all the way from when you generate recommendations and then when you write back to the, the underlying systems there. And because if you have two separate systems like this, I mean, it's, it's not like you're moving data and then one system is providing recommendations then what do you do with the recommendation? You know, it's just a prediction value. Without the deterministic logic combined with it, it becomes very difficult, you know, to automate that. So that's the other thing. That, and I think in, in your system, you mentioned AI and, and learning in your list initially when you just mentioned this, then machine learning. But I, I would put it a little differently. I would say that, you know, one of the key component of the decision intelligence is it has to learn automatically. Okay, so so one of the things which we call like era learned, I mean, is like how the users and what they're doing with the recommendations, how they are, you know, accepting it and what actions they are taking. The system should learn from it and learn from the outcomes of the recommendations. Okay, and that learning has to be an automated. So what we do, we create this recommendation and what we have done, we have created uh, what we call, uh, there's a new data model for decisions and recommendations, which is, uh, and we use this as a permanent memory for each decision and its impact. And there's no such model exist in the enterprise today because there's no way to capture these manual decisions which are happening outside the underlying system. So this is, again, it's a very important component, you know, for, for the decision intelligence. And, and, and I think I would add to your list the the system of user engagement also because you, you cannot uh, take this old way of like you know going in the UI and going into and and automating the decisions because this this whole new engagement systems is is very different than how people interact with it. So in, in our case, what we have done, we have built a, what we call is a cognitive workbench 
for the end user to interact with ERA and using a browser or a voice uh, on their mobile phone. And, and some of the customers call it is like a UI for an AI. I mean, and this workbench is the, think of it as a single place where the end users can interact with the systems and take actions. And, and, and this makes the, the adoption very simple and non-disruptive. I mean, we have very high adoption rates across customers with thousands of users using ERA daily. And, and they love the way they interact with the system because this makes it much, much easier for them. So, and, and an important critical part of the, this whole uh, decision intelligence is, yes, you have all these different technologies, but let's not forget about packaging these capabilities into this DI platform and be able to deliver it, you know. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of work we have done in the space of that how a customers and partners can package these capabilities into what we call skills. And we also provide a, you know, a whole slew of uh, pre-built, uh, pre-packaged skills out of the box for different use cases like demand forecasting, planning, inventory, finance. So, so, so the point I'm trying to make here is like, yes, there are pieces of the technologies in the past exist, but you need to add a lot more to it, number one. And then it has to work together as a single platform because you have seen in the past, people were doing all this work, you know, there, there are data lake initiative, there are visibility things there, but, but then what happens? Like you, you still have most of the things, decisions are still happening manually. You know, you have no shortage of analytics sitting in the company, you know, there's no shortage of dashboards, uh, but there's still, uh, you know, the, the value of the AI is not, you know, realized in most of the organization. So that's why I think it's, it's, it's different than how these different tools and then the approach of taking, you know, pieces together and trying to build it, I think it's not going to happen because I believe that you need a single platform for all of this to come together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess this is the uh, the premise uh, behind what you call uh, the ERA decision cloud, which is pretty much what you what you just described. So all of these components interconnected, plus of course the uh, necessary plumbing uh, that you need to bring all the data in, and so on and so forth. I think, however. Well, it's it's a pretty elaborate uh, platform. It's uh, that's that's quite quite obvious already. Uh, I think, however, there's a couple of uh, core uh, conceptual, let's say, fundamental issues that um, stood stood out for me at least uh, from from this whole uh, approach, uh, which have to do with well, uh, it's fine that when when you try to uh, to automate decision making uh, in in the way that you described by taking this approach and so on and so forth. Um, the, um, the, the issue you're trying to tackle is, is pretty real. It's basically a decision fatigue. So when you have an environment in which um, there's so much happening all the time, you need to make decisions all the time. And so if you're somehow able to automate that, then that definitely is going to uh, ease the burden on the people who need to make those decisions. However, I think the, the key issues here are basically transparency and uh, and accountability transparency in when you're suggesting an automated decision to someone that someone needs to be able to tell um, how uh, the system came to that decision to that recommendation actually because I, I presume that it's uh, the end responsibility with uh, accepting or rejecting the recommendation always lies with the person. Mm -hmm. So the person needs to be able to audit uh, how that decision uh, was uh, was recommended. And then um, if the person decides to, uh, to follow that recommendation and implement that decision, then accountability needs to happen in the, in the sense of, well, you already uh, mentioned a uh, sort of feedback loop that you use to uh, track the outcome of decisions and then um, mm -hmm. uh, fit that back into the system to be able to improve it. However, I would also, thinking from the point of view of the person who, um, who gets to, uh, to take that decision, it's also important to know who's accountable. So if I get a recommendation and I decide to pursue that recommendation, if it turns out to be a good outcome, <clears throat> do I get the, uh, the credit for it? If it turns out to be a bad outcome, do I get the blame for it? So how does that work in, uh, in the way that you have? Uh, so 
And uh, yeah, it's a very good question. I think you're they're, they're like kind of. I think there are two parts of this. One is you're talking about the trust, you know, and the decision, you know, and then providing users. So if you look at it, people, if I put myself in somebody, you know, a user shoes there, uh, the people will not trust if they have a black box and just give them a prediction number or recommendation without the rationales behind it, okay? Uh, they're not gonna trust it. So, and it's not just the explainability of the number and some of the people are talking about, in, you know, in the AI. Uh, so from our side, what we have done, we have taken a very different approach in this. So the first, when we generate the recommendation, we provide the entire context around the recommendation and explain the reasons why they should make that decision, supported by all the contextual analytics around the recommendation. And, and it has to be an easy to read language, you know, for them to understand, mm -hmm. okay? And we also provide them a way to override or reject, you know, the recommendation based on the, uh, the, the rationale which we are providing them, okay? And then what we do, as you mentioned earlier, that we store this entire context of recommendation and decision along with the point in time data used to generate the recommendation and into this what we call like a permanent memory. So, and, and this is the foundation of ERA's continuous learning as you, as you mentioned, and because this helps us also to build the trust with the users. So, uh, maybe if I give you an example, like for example, if ERA is recommending um, to increase the forecast because we are, let's say we are detecting an oversell uh, of a product of a certain market, okay? So what we do, then we store that entire inventory, that stock information, the sales data, the shipment, everything in the point in time, along with the audit trail of the decision event, okay? So now, we provide the user, and user either accept it or reject it. And we also storing that information. So let's say if the forecast is for July, and then in July, when the actual sales happens, what era, what we do, we era goes back and reevaluate the recommendation and see how much deviation was it from the actual from the recommendation of the forecast to the recommendation of the actuals. Or, I'm sorry, the, the actual numbers. And this is like a reinforced learning, you know, from the event. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not then the system is just, uh, you know, providing the information, but using this information also, the system is learning and adjusting it. And we are not separating what the users are saying. We are putting ERA, which is the automation, you know, the engine behind it, also on the same standards. So if we are recommending, and if somebody automated it and we accepted it, is the same outcome that we we are very clear that was it recommendation good or not. So if you look at it in a recent press release that we have just introduced a, a new automated uh, uh, confidence scoring feature for these recommendations. So if ERA is confident that a recommendation will be accepted and we have the right data to predict it, then we let the user know with that, you know, we have, we are like 85% confident and we explain it why. And if we are not confident, we also let the user know, you know, then we say like, okay, for this recommendation, you need to do more investigation before you accept it, okay? So, so that's why in ERA, what we call like there's a three mode of operations, okay, which we have seen across customs. So one, we call it like a decision support. So we call it like a human in the loop. So all the right contextual analytics is available for the humans to make decisions, but the more work is needed from the human to make sure, you know, that the decisions are, are the correct, okay? The other ones, what we call like the decision uh, augmentation, which is what we call like human on the loop. So it means that we are providing the recommendation with the high confidence based on on the past history and all the data which we have available at point in time. And we are asking the humans to accept the recommendation, okay? And then the third model is, uh, the mode is what we call like decision automation. So basically is the human is out of the loop. So what this means is the recommendations with the high confidence where, where the customer has decided to automate without any user intervention. 
Okay. Now, most of our customers are at the augmentation and automation board, which we have seen there. Okay. And, and one of the other things George was saying is it's amazing how a new vocabulary and KPIs are emerging around recommendation decisions. You know, like they're calling it decision velocity, like a decision lead time, percentage of accepted recommendation, percentage of automated. And, and, and you know, this is, this is pretty good because now they are start thinking in terms of how they're automating the decision. So that's the, so if you look at it from the trust standpoint, this is, I think, with all the information, with all the audit trails, providing the flexibility, you know, which mode we can, and be transparent to the users that, you know, look, I mean, we can predict or we cannot predict, you know, some of the things there is that's really helping. Okay. That's one thing then. Now, the other part of your question, which you're saying like, okay, you know, you mentioned about, you know, getting a blame or a credit, you know, for this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and there are similar discussions around this topic is happening, you know, with self-driving cars. You know, like who to, I mean, who to blame? I mean, if the car is in the accident or, you know, the car is over speeding there. So, uh, I mean, this, this discussion don't have a simple answer, you know, this. So, uh, I mean, the question is, is the, is the skill developer in IT is responsible, you know, for that or is a business owner of that process? Yeah. So, there's a lot of discussion on the systems making it today, uh, which are, the decision which I made today, which are not handled in the past. Because that's the other thing which we are seeing. We go to the customers and they're not even making decisions because they don't even know that there's a problem exist. Because as a humans, I mean, we cannot handle hundreds and thousands of decision points in real time. Okay. So, so as a platform vendor, I mean, what we do, we provide tools and guardrails for our customers to design these skills, uh, robust skills, and provide them way to add logic to course correct uh, in real time. So for example, the example I was giving you in the forecast, if the system is detected that there is an oversell, now what happens if it's a wrong decision? Then the system will also now detecting undersell in real time, okay? So now if we change the forecast to a much higher number and the sales are not coming, the system is still then detected as an, as an undersell and will help to adjust the forecast back, you know, there. So, and this is a very important point because people can make mistakes, things can happen, you know, even the machines can make it, but if you can catch it and correct it in real time, you know, quickly, then the impact of that is, is, is much, much lower. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I don't know if I, I'm going to answer your question there, but it is, I mean, it's, 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 it's an interesting topic, you know. I know, I know. I was just wondering, um, I would, to be honest with you, I was more uh, wondering whether you have any examples uh, from your clients. How do they deal with that internally? Because I guess it probably also has, it probably also is, um, well, organization specific, let's say, and even culture, uh, culture dependent. So how it's organization uh, deals uh, with that matter? Yeah, no, it, uh, what we are seeing again across our customers uh, that business is taking ownership of this. Because why? Because they are the one who is defining the, the rules. The data is generated by the business. You know what I'm saying there? In the rules there. And then IT is providing the technology to be able to, to use that uh, by using that data and using those rules, you know, what they're defining mm -hmm. uh, and the constraints. So, so I'm in, in my experience so far is more tilting towards the business, taking the ownership, either good or bad, you know, for that. because if it's something is good, I mean, definitely it helps the customers and they're really happy about it. And I would not say like blame or bad, because if something is not uh, working, you know, some of the things that the outcomes are not, they are now going and fine tuning, right. you know, the, the, some of the logic and some of the things on the recommendations because they miss some constraints or some of the things there and then they go and change it. And they make them. Mm -hmm. 
Another thing I was wondering about is whether there is the option of uh, somehow accounting for uh, external disruptive events, whether it's, I don't know, pandemics or some tanker being stuck in Suez or, I don't know, any, uh, any unforeseen uh, elements that are beyond the scope of the normal predictions. Is there the ability to somehow uh, ingest them, let's say, in the decision-making process? Yeah, so so there are two parts. I think one is like um, the event you talk about. Another is the external data, for example. So external data, of course, we are using, you know, we have uh, quite a few different data sets which comes out of the box, you know, from the external data side. Like whether I've seen it used a lot in forecasting and some of the other things there. And but there are also some of the paid data, you know, from the customers, like for example, Nielsen and uh, and IMS data or some of the customers are using around, you know, competitors analysis and things which can then uh, influence, for example, the what promotions they are running, you know what I'm saying? Like you may want, don't want to run buy one, get one free or or you want to run it if the com competitor is also running around that time there. So external data has definitely an, an impact on that. Now, one of the other thing which we are doing is now um, working on to provide, uh, to work with some of the other vendors who are providing like, you know, external events, you know, like supply chain disruption and some other mm -hmm. things, and then be able to take that and incorporate into a decision-making process. So, and and when I'm talking to these vendors there, some of the vendors are really excited because one of the biggest challenge what they have is like, okay, if there's a disruption happening, there's a fire happening there, you know, in, in this city or this location, or, or there's a storm, hurricane, what is the impact of this on the customer? Because they don't have the inside data. You see what I'm saying? So now what happens there, they're saying is maybe a three days delay on this because of the hurricane. Now, maybe it's perfectly okay for the customer because customer is holding a seven days of inventory. You know, so three days will not make a big difference, mm -hmm. you know, there, but in some customers, it may have a big impact there. So this is the next step, which we are working on now to work with uh, some of these other vendors who are providing this kind of information out there. But to, to answer your question, external data, definitely we're using it and it has an impact, but I, we want to take it to the next level. <clears throat> okay. Great, thanks. And I think that's also relevant, uh, again, for uh, the specific event uh, that's, that uh, you're going to be addressing uh, in, uh, in a few days, because uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's, uh, it's centered around uh, supply chain. And uh, well, there's a lot of disruption in supply chains happening uh, in, in the last period. Uh, another question I had was uh, whether you could provide any reference from, uh, from your customers on an estimate I understand it may vary wildly depending on you know the uh, the scope of implementation, let's say, but an estimate uh, for a typical, let's say, end-to-end -end, uh, uh, deployment of your system. So, how long uh, does uh, should someone expect uh, to take uh, for for the system to be fully deployed and operational, and you know incorporate all the data sources and automate all the decisions and so on? Yeah. So uh, the way. Uh, the, the way it works with, with our customers, which I have seen it, is uh, because it's a SaaS platform, so there's not much time needed to set up and everything there. So it's, it's a SaaS offering. Uh, the implementation time, what they do, they start what we call skills. Okay, So we have quite a few skills out of the box. Partners are creating skills. So skills, I think of it as pre-packaged in the application. So if you have a skill around demand forecasting, if you skill around procurement, skill around promotion, some you know, of the other things there. That's one of the thing, if a skill is already available, we just have to connect. And that's what I was telling you very early on, that we have built the data model, the integrations with as, with all of that. So if they have like uh, some of all the major ERP systems, like, you know, SAP and Oracle and, you know, Jerry Edward and, you know, some of the Salesforce and all that, then those implementations are, you know, it can take between four to six weeks for that skill to be operational, you know, mm -hmm. running there. And this is what we're doing with the customers. I mean, some of the implementation is super fast, you know, to be able to up and running, you know, there. Now, uh, because it's a platform, so some of our customers, when we go, they go and say, I want to uh, create some skill, which we have not built yet, for example. 
but they can create it because it's a platform. So for that, I have noticed that it takes between, you know, I would say seven to 10 weeks for that skill because it's not like I have to go and boil the entire ocean there. You start from the areas where you want to automate. And then what the customers do, they create one of our customers. I've seen it. I mean, I saw the presentation recently in their uh, quarterly business quarterly review. They have created a roadmap of like 40 skills, you know, for a year, which they want to implement around different areas, like from logistics to procurements to inventory to uh, even to finance in some of the area in there. So it's all depend on the skills. So you go in, quickly deploy the system uh, there, take one or two skills, roll it out in production, and then have a roadmap of a journey right. of how you want to do that. So that's how we have seen implementation. Right. So organizations um, do it in an incremental way and that, that obviously makes uh, makes sense yeah yeah okay uh, i guess we are close to wrapping up so in a way um, uh, we approach uh, this a little bit uh, in an unorthodox way because well the occasion is that you're actually announcing uh, some uh, new product features and uh, we saved that for last but i think it was important to just start from the beginning and lay out uh, uh, you know the, the groundwork for uh, what it is that you do and the way that you approach it. So now that we've done it, uh, you may as well uh, refer to the new product updates and what they bring to the table. Yeah. So, uh, and I think one other thing which you see in our in our update, uh, which we're doing for the new product, is there's a lot of work is happening around what we call Era Cortex framework, which is our AI engine. You know, around it there. So two, three important things around that. One is that this whole new auto ML uh, engine, which is fully integrated into our, our system. So, you, I mean, you have heard about auto ML and, you know, the people are doing it a different tool, but, but what we have done is we have integrated into our, uh, the entire platform in a way that, for example, uh, if I take one skill and if I'm running it to, let's say one customer, then I go to another customer, the same skill will behave differently because then once we start getting the data, all the process of automatically now running an auto ML, generating the model, deploying that model based on their data, and then using that model to generate recommendation is fully automated, touchless. So you don't have to do this. So the whole ML ops process and everything there is all automated. So this new auto ML engine, which we have done there. So this is this is very good because we don't have to go and now modify skills because the skills can then adapt to itself automatically, you know, from one customer to another based on the data which you're doing there. So that's the one big thing which we have done. Uh, the other thing is we believe that opening up the platform and if and make it much easier for the data scientists and others uh, uh, at the customer side. So if they want to bring up their own models, if they have a team, they have created something there, no problem, use the ERA notebooks, bring your own models you know, into the ERA and then operationalize it in ERA. Because one of the biggest challenges that they're facing is even though they have a model, you know, they have data science team, but how are they going to operationalize it? So we made that part much, much easier now you know, do that in ERA. So it's not just ERA model. I can bring my own model, you know, into ERA and then operationalize it. And then all the things around how are we going to make sure that the model is keep performing, model versioning, model drifting, automatic training of the models. So all of that part is, is now automated. And this is where, that's why it's very exciting about that part of the, of that, of the release there. And the second part is like, you know, how we're making it easier and easier for, um, the users to look at the information in ERA. So like, for example, uh, we, you know, releasing the graph explorer. Uh, now, I mean, we had a graph internally there, but the users don't have much access. But now what we have done, we have created a new explorer where the end users can now go and click and explore uh, their data, which is sitting into our CDL, into the graph and be able to see not just, you know, how the data is, but also what the relationships are you know, between the data and then find, um, you know, the information there. So that's one big thing. The confidence scores, I've already told you, 
that we are doing, making it easier and easier for the users to, to make the decision and where ARA will, will be able to tell them how confident it is from that. And yeah, so around, so mostly is around, around that. And that's why we, it was worth mentioning because this is a, you know, automating and you know, you're coming from the industry, like, you know, the automating the entire ML ops operation, you know, into it, which you don't have to even modify the application and the application will then adapt to itself, uh, what we call our skills. So that's, that's very powerful. And then opening it up to, you know, a bigger audience of the data science team. So uh, look, you do your work. If you haven't spent years in working into your own models, we'll help you operationalize it into that. Yeah, I think actually all all three of those areas are important for, for different reasons, for the ones that you mentioned. I would personally um, uh, pick out uh, the, the graph visualization out of that, not for any other reason that you know, the others are equally important, I would say. It's just because I have a personal, let's say, uh, <laughs> uh, phone uh, tendency to, to, to be attracted to the graph. And it's, it's something I, uh, I write about a lot. So I'm think, uh, mm -hmm. I think business users will appreciate the ability to, to drill down in that way and uh, be able to manage complex recommendations uh, that way. You know, I'll tell you, George, the most excitement is getting created around that from the end user. Okay. Because when we're showing, I mean, uh, I, I remember doing a demo to a user. We said, oh, let's just look at your bomb and look at your supply and look at your customer. Within a few seconds, we're able to show the entire supply chain map, you know, how their suppliers are connected, you know, to the products and bill of material and then how the bill of material is connected, you know, down to the product and how the products are going to the customer. And now they're saying like, oh, can I just see the lead times across my entire supply chain? And those things were like, you know, it's it becomes so powerful. So I, I completely, from a demo standpoint, I think you will see maybe later on also when we're going to start, you know, putting some videos or something that that is, is, is very exciting. I'm kind of assuming that probably there is some sort of uh, graph uh, database or graph analytics running uh, under the hood to enable you to um, to offer those visualizations and uh, explore those uh, relationships. Yeah, so we have underlying, yes. So there are graph databases, uh, you know, the graph database is running there. And we are, you know, one is like, you know, the commodity databases you can use, you know, from the graph or something there from the vendor. But then on top of it, what we have done, we have built like a layer of cache and, uh, you know, and combine the, the tabular data, you know, with the graph. So one of the biggest challenge with the graph in the past, because I think you, you must be aware of it, that you cannot use the graph for analytics. If you want to do like massive amount of calculations, you should have seen there across like billions of, you know, the rows there, the, it takes a very long time, you know, because you have to go and traverse all the vertex there. But can you combine the power of like a columnars with the graph? So then what you can do, you can offload the calculations, you know, to that engine and then have the graph do the uh, relationships and linkage between the data. So that's a lot of work which we have done around that to bringing those two together. So then I can scale the graph to, you know, if you have 100,000 products with millions and millions of combinations, you know, there, which can translate into billions of, um, you know, the, the, uh, the relationships and, you know, the entity, that will be able to support it. Okay, there. So, so that's, a, we believe that's a big part which we have done you know, to make and just not just pre presenting a graph to the user. Right. Well, it sounds like um, a use case uh, in and of itself. And well, you may want to uh, to publicize it uh, further down the road. And in case you have uh, worked with, uh, well, commercial uh, graph database or analytics vendors, I'm sure they will be very keen to, to work with you on on that as well. Yes. And we are working with, with, with the vendor there already on the underlying, you know, there. Okay, great. So, well, looking forward to to learning uh, more about uh, what's uh, what's happening under the hood there. Yeah. So, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook.